Yeah, we're back. We're live. It's three o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Think Tech. It's energy in America. Okay, very important discussion today about the economy, the energy economy uh, of China. Okay, from a researcher from EPRINC, Energy Policy Research Organization in, in Washington that we deal with um, and that reports to us. Uh, its president is Lou Puglierisi, not available today, but a researcher by the name of Batulia O, o Garel, Odd Garel, yeah, is here with us. We'll call him Bat. Can we call you Bat, Bat? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show. Um, so tell, tell us what's going on in, in China these days about its economy and about energy in China, um, you know, despite the fact that the United States is having arguments with China like every day. Uh, what do you find? So there are a lot of things happening in China right now. Um, from U.S.-China trade deal review to um, a lot of companies um, transfer and agreements and to floods in, in, in the Yangtze River uh, region in China. So the Chinese government is a lot, under a lot of pressure at this point and the, and the, the economy is projected to grow by around 1% to 2% this year which is, uh, you know, uh, which will make China probably the only country, only major economy to have a positive economic growth this year. Why is that, Pat? I mean, why, you know, uh, China had a terrible time at the beginning of the year. Um, they had to do you know, really hard things in order to get back, back to ship shape with, uh, with COVID. Um, they were, they, 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 they clamped down um, there were all kinds of issues about reopening the economy. They, I think they they forced the point, and they did to some extent reopen. But now for them to find, now for us to find that in the course of this whole year, where they had such trouble at the beginning of the year, they're still going to have a positive uh, uh, GDP growth. That's quite remarkable. What what do you, what do you attribute that to? Um, can we um, pull up the first graph? Um, so um, China. You know, if you look at this graph by um, Johns Hopkins University, um, the U.S., Hawaii, um, and the world, they are all, you know, um, having daily cases not really getting better or, you know, uh, going back to normalcy. But if you look at China, um, everything, almost everything happened um, in February and March. So um, what, you know, how it started was, Back in January, um, uh, on January 23rd, um, there was a complete lockdown in Wuhan city. And then um, China had a very heavy handed lockdown uh, across the country. That helped um, the uh, you know, authoritarian uh, approach, if I may, um, helped China to uh, enforce um, social distancing and all the other um, uh, norms and rules to fight against the pandemic, uh, against the virus. And thanks to that, um, starting in early March, um, things got better. People went, you know, started going back to work and school, and now uh, schools are in session. So, um, yeah, so. so. Right now, the lockdown is over. <clears throat> is that what you're saying? That the people are back in school, they're back at work. The <clears throat> the economy has returned to I don't want to say normal, but what it was before COVID. Am I right? Yeah. So it is. Um, I would say it's pretty much thanks to the um, you know strict lockdown that was placed um, in you know earlier uh, this year, and um, that that helped a lot. Um, and then um, since then, China has been you know, exporting a lot, and then the uh, government has uh, introduced, uh, you know, a, a lot of um, stimulus packages, policies, and subsidies to boost the economy. And then, then for those reasons, um, now China is loosening its restrictions. And um, just recently, China allowed um, people, travelers from 30, plus European countries and some uh, South and Southeast Asian countries to travel to China. And then there were strict provincial um, uh, travel restrictions in China. And then those are also um, uh, 
they, they are also losing those restrictions. Well, it's a success story, isn't it? I mean, I guess, I guess it teaches you something. If you have, um, you know, a serious lockdown and you enforce the lockdown, maybe they over-enforce it in some ways, um, but then, you know, you actually recover. Now, they must still have the infection to some extent. It doesn't go away completely. And they don't have any, uh, you know, identifiable vaccine right now yet. Um, so, uh, but, but it sounds like whatever infections they have in whatever parts of the country, um, that doesn't material, uh, materially affect um, the uh, improvement, uh, the restarting of, of its economy. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, you know, China is having daily case, still having daily cases. And then, you know, there is an app by Alipay and some other uh, Chinese social media uh, companies um, to rate provinces based on their risks. And then now Chinese people are using, and even pro provi provincial, provincial authorities are using those apps to um, to determine, you know, how the situation is in each of the regions. And then until, you know, they have a vaccine and, um, you know, a guarantee that it will not uh, bring another spread of the virus, there will still be a certain degree of, um, of lockdown or restrictions. You know, it's interesting. I, I was just watching TV an hour ago. <clears throat> and, you know, we have the, we have this gathering, the motorcycle gathering in, in Sturgis, uh, what was it, Mich Michigan, um, mm -hmm. and uh, a few weeks ago, and, and somebody wanted a track to see how the infection would, would uh, spread out of this big mo motorcycle gathering. <clears throat> and they were able to, to, to give you a national chart of how it spread on the basis of cell phones. So somebody was able to take a picture, it must have been the cell phone carriers, of who was in Sturgis at the time of their gathering. And then they took a picture a few weeks later of those exact same cell phones returning to the homes of those individuals in various places around the country. And you could see it on a chart. I didn't know we had this, this kind of you know, collaborative technology. Um, and China must be doing much better than that. But fact is, you could see it spreading with this chart of cell phone movements all over the country. I'm sure it was anonymous, nobody's privacy was violated, but on a, on a macro level, you know, you could see this happening. And I'm sure that in China, they're much more sophisticated uh, with, um, you know, testing and, and tracing. Are you familiar with what they are doing? So uh, my understanding is that um, LPA, CT, some other um, uh, major companies, social media companies, have come up with an app to to give um, you know a, a color coded um, uh, system, which was agreed upon by um, provinces, provincial, local authorities, and then if you are from you, I think my understanding is that you give. Um, you enter your personal information, where you're from, and then where you've been, you know, traveling, and based on those um, information, they give you um, one of the three uh, colors: the red, green, um, yellow. And then if you have a green uh, color, um, you can pretty much travel to any part of the country. If you are, are red, it's gonna be prob problematic. Uh, but it, there are also certain indicators. And then if you're from a region where there were over 50 cases in the past 14 days, um, that, you know, your color will, will be red. But in the past few weeks, there hasn't been uh, much of a spike in China. Um, I don't think uh, there will be yeah, many regions where you, people will be assigned red. Mm. It's very interesting. By the way, I should add that on the Sturgis um, uh, gathering, um, those charts uh, also showed that um, there have been infections as a result all over the country. Hundreds of infections have spread out of Sturgis because they were there without distancing, without, without masks. They didn't follow any of the rules. And um, gee, it's really, it's really tragic, but it could have been avoided.
Anyway, um, you also mentioned uh, that um, uh, China is letting various travelers in now. Does that include the United States, Pat? Um, it unfortunately doesn't include the United States. Um, I looked that up. Um, it, didn't, it didn't seem like the U.S. is included on the list. Um, and the various other countries were not uh, included on the list. Um, I think, um, I think but, the, but China will start adding more countries, but we will see. Yeah, well, it's just smart. I mean, uh, they've, they've, done, they've done a good job, although you could quibble with um, some of the techniques they've used. Um, and, I, and I suppose uh, they're prepared to use those techniques again uh, if there's a, a, a resurgence of, of the infection. Um, I don't think there's any question they would because they're not going to tolerate, uh, you know, increases and spikes in infection. Mm -hmm. So you say the economy is um, doing well, <clears throat> much better than expected. So let's connect that up with energy. Okay? Yeah. <clears throat> how, is, how is their energy doing? Where are they getting their energy from? How are they using? What are the numbers on their, uh, you know, importation and use of energy? What kinds of energy? Yeah, um, before, but before that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the economy as a whole. Um, yes, please. It, yeah, so um, in, the, in the first quarter, the economy plunged by 6.8%. Um, by and then starting in um, quarter two, uh, they showed uh, over 3% growth. And then um, manufacturing is now... Is, is, is recovering, although at a much slower pace um, and the services industry, you know, compared to manufacturing is growing at a much better uh, pace. Um, and um, because of manufacturing being, you know, slow dragging, you know, growth a little bit, energy um, was affected by that early, in the year, and um, and then you know, I'd like to. I can talk about other things that are happening in China, including the floods in the Yangtze River, and then the unemployment rates, um, and the agricultural situation. Yeah, please. Uh, deteriorated by um, by the uh, floods, and then how much you know um, pressure um, foreign. Divest, divest, divesture is putting uh, pressure on, on the leadership of CCP. Um, uh, but with, in, with regards to um, with regards to the energy sector, um, I can I, let's go to the uh, pull up the second uh, graph. So here you can see uh, what industries have been affected most in the first six, um, uh, seven months of the year. And the first, the, 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 the biggest loser was um, extraction of oil and um, gas. Although um, it, 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 the graph shows the revenue of the industry, uh, but you know, the total volume of um, oil and gas production during the period actually increased. Um, and then the other um, losers, if I may, in terms of um, total rev uh, revenue um, include textiles and then other energy and, um, and other industries. And uh, in terms of winners, um, there are the biggest one is computer communications equipment, followed by um, um, uh, special purpose machinery and cigarettes and tobacco, interestingly. And then, you know, out of all these 35 or so um, large industries, um, petroleum and natural gas extraction uh, experienced the biggest loss during the first seven months. Um, and if we uh, can go to the third- well, Just one point on that, it sounds parallel uh, to the US. I mean, our stock market, which is uh, at heights we cannot explain, uh, <clears throat> has done well on the basis of tech stocks. And the tech stocks that have done well, the ones in communications like Zoom. Um, and so I would imagine, check me on this, I would imagine that the reason these Chinese uh, communications stock, uh, stocks and um, 
uh, I guess, and software stocks that deal in communication, like Zoom, are doing well because the Chinese people are using programs like Zoom, just the way we are in the in the in the COVID uh, pandemic. Am I right? Yeah, that's. Um, I, I agree. I totally agree. Um, in the pandemic. Um, industries like you know um, that would allow people to work from home or put people to maintain good social distancing and also medical um, supplies um, and things like that they are showing growth and uh, in a positive um, return to investment whereas um, you know other industries that require more personal, um, interactions um, have been suffering, uh, but but analysts and you know and China experts um, expect a more positive growth in the second half. But um, you know I'm not being ex- you know extremely optimistic about about the second half as well because um, you know in in the in the short run. Um, China might rebound, you know, continue this rebounds, and then um, end up end the year with a, with a positive growth. But um, there uh, need to be a lot of um, structural changes, and uh, and a lot of reforms, you know, in the post pandemic world. And um, so, yeah, um, there is a lot of parallel, but also there are a lot of differences between the United States and China. Well, one thing is is clear that our supply line uh, has needed and still does need supply, manufactured goods and other things from China. Um, And since our economy is in the tank and is likely to continue in the tank for some time because of the the pandemic, um, we're, we're not buying as much uh, from China, I imagine, I'm guessing about this, uh, th- than we were. And therefore, uh, to the extent that China's um, economy is dependent, at least in, in substantial part, on purchasing from by the U.S., that's ultimately going to constrain China's economy. Isn't it true? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, um, the, the economy, U.S., China, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it brings us to the uh, U.S.-China trade deal. And the, the first phase one trade deal was signed early this year. And uh, both sides, you know, especially the uh, U.S. was expecting a lot from it. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, nothing much has happened since then. Um, and, uh, the, you know, both sides are reviewing their phase one deal um, results. And if you look at the energy numbers, um, only 5% of, um, of the Chinese commitment, you know, the, the energy goods that China committed to buy from the U.S., uh, you know, was made uh, during the time, and the other ninety-five percent um, didn't come to, you know, fruition. So, um, yeah. So, so there needs to be follow-ups and then um, uh, enforcement to, to uh, you know, and also other. Uh, initiatives from uh, from the from both sides to mm. promote that yep so here the in terms of energy production um, you know we talked about uh, total you know uh, total, talked about revenue uh, by industry and the natural gas and uh, crude oil extraction suffered the most loss but um, but if you look at this graph, year-on-year year increase in domestic energy output shows that natural gas actually grew by 9.5%, um, whereas you know other energy sectors like hydro, coke, um, decreased during the first seven months compared to the same period last year. Mm-hmm. And crude oil, crude processing, nuclear, solar, wind, they all grew during the period. And if you can go to the next slide, please. So where are they getting the LNG, Beth? Um, China gets 
It's LNG from a variety of sources. Um, so, um, you know, before LNG, let's talk about the natural gas um, of China. So China is a massive consumer of natural gas, the biggest importer of natural gas in the world and second biggest LNG, na liquefied natural gas importer in the world. Mm -hmm. And then it gets, uh, it, it, it produces over half of its natural gas uh, domestically, 55% of its uh, 300, uh, billion cubic meters of gas, uh, but that doesn't, um, you know, in the, that is not enough for the, uh, the huge market China has for natural gas, which is driven by, you know, policies to fight air pollution and then to displace coal um, in favor of more, you know, in the a cleaner, energy uh, resources. And in terms of sources, China gets uh, a majority of its uh, LNG from Australia and Qatar, followed by many other countries in the, uh, in the Southeast Asia um, and also in the Middle East. And um, Australia, uh, Qatar are the biggest um, exporters to China. And then China also imports liquefied natural gas from the United States. And, um, you know, during the trade tension between the United States and China, things didn't look very good for the LNG liquefied natural gas industry. So, um, so uh, you know, from 2018 to early this year, there was, almost no um, cargo uh, exported from the United States to China. But thanks to the uh, phase one deal I mentioned, gonna put some effort into that. And then also the economics were favorable. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, several cargos were sent uh, to China, LNG cargos were delivered to China um, starting in April this year, and then that continued. That trend continued in the following months. You know, so, one thing is um, that we had expected. We, the United States, had expected to sell a lot of LNG to China uh, through a hub in Japan, as I recall from discussions with Luke Pugliarisi. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder if is is that is that being curtailed now? Are we realizing our expectations in, in terms of marketing LNG to China? So um, LNG is, uh, LNG trade, you know, consists not just of, you know, uh, agreements, bilateral government level agreements, but also um, the economics of, um, of the industry, you know, in, in Asia, uh, you you know from to 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 uh, to sell natural gas from the United States to Asia, uh, you you know there are a lot of costs added to to the natural gas itself, natural gas price itself. You have to pay for transportation, liquefaction, and other fees and costs. So um, at the moment. Um, in the you know Asian spot markets have uh, very low um, liquefied you know natural gas prices, which is not extremely favorable for for U.S. LNG at the at the at this uh, uh, point. But um, running you know uh, run up to uh, the uh, winter heating season in Asia. Uh, there will be more demand from Asian buyers, which will uh, increase the price back to about six um, six dollars uh, per million BTU uh, or beyond that. So and that'll make it more profitable for American suppliers. So that will, yeah, that will, uh, you know, those circumstances will allow American and other um, natural gas producers to um, export gas to China. Mm -hmm. 
You know, Pat, I, I wanted to uh, pick up on something else you said, and, it, and that is uh, China is very mindful of, um, you know, the effect uh, that COVID has had on its economy and it's trying to rebuild the economy, but in the process, uh, the economy is changing. Uh, and when China comes out of COVID, so to speak, as, as other countries, uh, its economy will be different. Um, the importation of uh, natural resources, the exportation of manufactured goods, uh, you know, the, um, the momentum of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, all, across, uh, all across Asia and, and then to Europe that, that, and Africa, that will, that will probably change. Um, and certainly its relationship, its trading relationship with the U.S., depending on who's elected president in November, um, that will change. But I wanted to get your thoughts on how. What will the economy of China look like when things settle down? What will the economy of China look like post-COVID? So post-COVID, um, we don't know yet when this will end. Next year, later this year, next year, or 2022. Uh, but um, they have a very important um, you know, uh, meetings and uh, they have... Uh, important meetings coming up later this year in October they have a, a the Communist Party has a plenary session and then uh, in March next year um, the, the the State Council or the government of uh, of, uh, of, of China has to um, uh, provide issue their uh, 14th five-year plan which is a very important document and from that, I think we will be able to see a lot of changes they expect um, to see um, in their economy and in their policy in the next five years. But as of now, um, based on what a lot of Chinese um, experts and uh, government officials are publicly saying, um, you know, due to the trade tension, they are more you know, concerned about their dependency on um, technologies, um, you know, foreign technologies, because, for example, um, you know, companies like Huawei and other AI-based uh, um, telecommunications companies, they their uh, operations are kind of stalling because of um, uh, you know um, of uh, the supply constraint situation. You know, for chips, they have to. They don't have enough capacity to to produce, you know, those uh, the, the the much needed chips for their um, equipment. So they, they have to buy it from elsewhere. And in the current circumstances, um, uh, it's it's becoming extremely hard for them to do that. So they are trying to become more, um, you know, uh, independent in those technologies. And they had. Uh, announced a policy to to promote you know um, their research and um, development capabilities um, by year by the year 2025, which is called Made in 2025. Um, you know, due to uh, some concerns expressed by other countries, they have become you know rather mute about that policy. But I think that will still be uh, a play. An important role in their um, future, you know, economy and the future policy planning. One one last thing that comes to mind, Brad, is this: uh, United States uh, has been, um, you know, the number one economy for a long time. Uh, China has uh, has you know improved its economy. Uh, arguably, it's a second economy behind the United States, or it has been. Um, and now, what we have is the American economy is suffering and. Uh, there doesn't seem to be an end in sight for that, except if the, uh, there's a successful vaccine um, and COVID is uh, subdued. Um, but, but the Chinese seem to have uh, handled this. Of course, there are questions about credibility, about statements that come from China may not be entirely credible and you know, on self-serving propaganda maybe. But it seems like from all the sources, it seems like China is making great progress. Um, and it's coming back. It's coming back, even though it had a hard time. <clears throat> so my question to you is, that, how is this going to change, do you think, the relative position 
of China and the United States in the in the world economy. Uh, will the United States come to second? Will China come to first? Um, what what do you think will happen in, in the years to come to change the relative positions of these two countries? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, I as a researcher try to see things from a long term perspective, not just uh, you know short term. You know, because I, I don't want things change in the long term um, events. You know, things change and the world changes due to a lot of factors and even a lot in the short term current events. But, you know, thinking of it just in terms of the COVID is, in my opinion, not, um, not a good way to look at how the world works. And, um, and then China was able to, you know, rebound and, um, and then, um, you know, it, its economy is compared to other uh, economies doing well, but it is still suffering from a lot of, you know, missed, um, uh, you know, a lot of losses and, um, and a, a variety of other reasons. But at the same time, there are other geopolitical uh, factors that will potentially play out um, later uh, in the year or maybe once everything is settled. Um, for example, you know, uh, I'm not a I'm not a geopolitical expert or I'm not a political expert scientist, but um, countries, you know, such as Australia, started expressing their um, disappointment with China's handling of the you know virus uh, early early on. So you know they are not had. I think there will be more countries. Uh, demanding um, uh, compensation or punishment for for the virus. Uh, so I think in addition to all those economic uh, factors, these, um, you know, those will also need to be taken into consideration. Yeah. Well, very interesting, Bet. Uh, Bet Ogarel of EPRINC, um, a research analyst at EPRINC uh, talking about the economics of China here in the time of what appears to be a recovery from COVID. Thank you so much, Pat. Really appreciate you coming on. Really appreciate uh, your, your, your knowledge and expertise in these areas. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Aloha.